Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cameron Kaufman, and I'm the president of the Buckley Program. I'd like to welcome you to our event this afternoon, a firing line debate on the trade war with China. Today, we're going to have Gordon Chang debating Yale professor Stephen Roach. And our event's going to be moderated by Yale professor Daniel Mattingly. Um, and before I give a full introduction to our guests, I just want to make a couple quick announcements. Firstly, for those of you who don't know, the Buckley Program is an organization dedicated to promoting free speech and intellectual diversity on campus. You do this in a variety of ways, including hosting seminars, lectures, firing line debates, and an annual conference. You can learn more about our program on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Secondly, we don't have any events until after Thanksgiving break, but be on the lookout for some of them as we do have a couple to take note of. In early December, we're going to be hosting former Senator Tom Coburn on an event on health care and drug prices, and we're also going to be hosting a firing line debate on public sector unions. So keep an eye out for both of those. And then finally, our format for today's event will go as follows. Professor Roach and Mr. Chang will both do a five-minute opening statement. Then we're going to have Professor Manningly moderate about a 30-minute discussion of back and forth. He's then going to ask a question and frame a closing statement for about five minutes each. And then we're going to have about 20 minutes for audience Q&A. So you guys will have time to ask both of our participants questions. So now, on to our guests. Stephen Roach is a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs and a senior lecturer at Yale School of Management. He was formerly the chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and the firm's chief economist for the bulk of his 30-year career at Morgan Stanley. He's the author of multiple books, including Unbalanced, The Codependency of America and China, obviously a book very pertinent to this topic. Mr. Roach also holds several other board positions, including sitting on the Council on Foreign Relations and the China Advisory Board of the Environmental Defense Fund. He's going to be arguing for more cooperation with China and with a skepticism towards the trade war. The other side, we have Gordon Chang. Mr. Chang is a columnist, a television pundit, and an author. He's a contributor to Forbes, frequently writing pieces about the Chinese economy, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Commentary. Mr. Chang is the author of the famous 2001 book, The Coming Collapse of China, and a 2006 book, Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. He has a much more bearish view on the Chinese economy and believes that Chinese economic weaknesses can be exploited in a trade war. Finally, our moderator is Professor Daniel Mattingly. He studies comparative politics with a focus on political economy, authoritarianism, and Chinese politics. His current research examines communal and ethnic politics, local governance, and the history of state building in China. He received his BA from Yale and his PhD from Cal Berkeley. So I am very much looking forward to this event. We have some great substantive disagreement on the topic, and it's a key policy issue. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot and watching a demonstration on civil discourse about a contentious issue. So with that, please give it up for our two guests and our moderator. Great. Well, thanks, Cameron, for that introduction and for inviting us here to speak. I couldn't think of two more distinguished guests to, uh, to launch this debate on China and uh, trade war, which of course is one of the most important topics facing U.S.-China relations. So as a moderator, I'll mostly try to stay out of the way and, uh, and let, our, let our guests speak. So first, uh, Professor Stephen Roach. Thank you, uh, <coughs> David. Is this working? All right. Um, actually, I wanted Gordon to go first. You're the, you're the guest, I mean, uh, but... <coughs> Um, as long as I'm talking, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, and I really I want to thank Gordon for coming. I've, you and I have <coughs> known each other for quite some time, and we've um, enjoyed the opportunity to exchange uh, views, even though we're sort of on the different side of this key issue. <laughs> um, trade war with China, good and easy to win. Uh, my answer is no and no. Uh, first, I think the very concept of a bilateral trade war for a nation like the United States um, that has a multilateral trade problem, that's a ruse. It's a ruse on the American public and a ruse on China and I would say the world as a whole. When you have a saving shortfall, <coughs> um, you need to borrow surplus savings from abroad. It's as simple as that if you want to grow. Uh, and when you do that, you have current account deficits, 
uh, and uh, multilateral trade deficits with the rest of the world. We've had a savings shortfall and a current account deficit almost every single year since 1982. Uh, and as a result, we've had multilateral trade deficits. Uh, now, uh, the last count in, in uh, 2017 was with 102 countries. China's the biggest, but you guys are smart. Take China out, higher math gives you still 101 other countries we run uh, trade deficits with. Uh, and um, saving shortfalls and multilateral trade deficits, in my view, are joined at the hip. And so without fixing the savings problem, and by the way, um, with these Trump tax cuts, they're going from bad to worse, you can close down the trade with China um, all you want with tariffs, but the Chinese piece then simply gets shifted to another country, uh, a higher cost uh, source of foreign goods that we need to make ends meet, uh, and um, that turns out to be a cruel tax on American consumers. Basic economics tells me that um, there cannot be, in any way whatsoever, a bilateral fix for a multilateral problem. So this conflict isn't about trade, no matter what the politicians will tell you. Don't let them uh, pull the wool over your eyes. Um, it's based instead on fears that China poses an existential threat to America's economic future, fears that are well documented uh, in a, a report that was um, published last March by uh, the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, um, which alleges that China is uh, uh, in violation uh, of uh, uh, charges on innovation, technology transfer. And I would submit to you, without really going into the details, that this report is also a ruse. Um, it has uh, charges of forced technology trans transfer through joint ventures. Uh, it accuses China of using its outbound M&A activity to act as a predator in illegally gobbling up American technology companies. Uh, it claims that China is unique in its use of state-subsidized industrial policies to uh, uh, achieve unfair advantage uh, in uh, dominating uh, the new emerging industries of the future. And of course, it goes over cyber hacking. Each of these charges, I think, at best is an exaggeration, and at worst uh, is uh, false. The second point, how am I doing with time? Another minute. Another minute, OK. Second um, aspect of this question that a trade war is easy to win, don't believe it for a second. Uh, this is a two-way relationship. Uh, sure, uh, China relies on the U.S. Uh, as a major, if not the largest, um, buyer of its exports. But we in the United States, no matter what uh, your politicians will tell you, uh, we rely on China. For number one, $500 billion in cheap imports to make ends meet uh, for income-constrained uh, consumers. Two is the largest for foreign owner of our treasuries, and we're going to be issuing a lot more of them uh, with these um, uh, reckless tax cuts. And three is our third largest and most rapidly growing export market behind Canada and Mexico. In a trade war, we both lose. China loses short term as its 30% uh, drop in the stock market and slowing GDP growth indicates. But we uh, lose longer term uh, because we just don't want to save. So China is far from perfect. I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything about China is good. But it's time for us to call this trade war for what it really is, a diversionary tactic that deflects attention away uh, from the need that we have in the U.S. to solve our own problems, uh, which are saving. And we've got to stop blaming others for our insatiable desire to live beyond our means. Japan, remember Japan? They were the villain 30 years ago. Now it's China. Don't we ever get tired of finding others to blame for our own problems? Thank you. Thanks, Professor Roach.
Kang. Well, thank you, Dan, and, and thank you, Stephen. Um, whether we call this a trade war or something else, we are involved in a struggle with China. And that struggle, whether it's easy or hard to win, is essential for us. It's, gonna, it's essential for us to prevail. So, so let's get started. Despite what people say, the Trump administration did not start the trade war with the tariffs. The Trump administration imposed tariffs under Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974 as a remedy for the theft of U.S. intellectual property. And as you saw in the Lighthizer report, but also in the Blair Huntsman Commission of 2013 plus its 2017 update, China steals hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. intellectual property each year. But regardless of the amount, we are not going to have a future as a country if we cannot commercialize our innovation. So it's essential for us to protect our IP. Now, Beijing has backed us into a corner. But fortunately for us, I think there are five things that tell us that we can prevail um, in this contest with China. First of all, last year, uh, our merchandise trade deficit with China was $375.6 billion. And as history says, trade deficit countries do relatively well when there is trade friction. Second of all, we don't have an economy that is geared to selling things to China, but China has an economy geared to selling things to us. Last year, China's merchandise trade surplus against the United States was a stunning 88.9% of its overall merchandise trade surplus. Third, we've got an economy that is bigger than China's. Last year, we produced $19.39 trillion of gross domestic product. China claimed $12.84 trillion, but that surely was an exaggeration. They claimed 6.9% growth last year. But to put that in context, let's look at what happened in 2016 when China claimed 6.7% growth. In the middle of last year, the World Bank issued a chart which showed that China's GDP growth in 2016 was 1.1%. And if you think that number is stunningly low, it is consistent with the single most reliable indicator of Chinese economic activity, which is total primary energy consumption. And according to Beijing's official sources, total primary energy consumption in 2016 grew by 1.4%. Right now, we have an economy that's growing 3.5%. I think China is growing we don't really know, but probably less than three. So not only does the United States have an economy bigger than China's, we have an economy that's growing faster. And as we all know, and as China itself says, look, you know, bigger economies push smaller economies around, especially when the gap is this big. And fourth, the American economy, for all its faults, and Stephen's very good on this in terms of talking about uh, the problems we have in our economy, which are serious, um, but for all our faults, our economy is relatively stable, and China's not, because China's heading to a systemic debt crisis. Right now, China is producing perhaps one and a half times as much debt as it's incurring gross, uh, as it's producing nominal GDP. And of course, countries can't do that forever. Um, and I don't think China can do it very long, and that's not only my prediction, but that's also the prediction of Zhou Xiaochuan, who last October, when he was the chief of China's central bank, warned publicly that China was heading to its Minsky moment, the moment when asset values collapse. Chinese people also think this, because in survey after survey, we see that slightly less than 50% of Chinese wealthy plan to leave their country, and we see that they're taking their money with them. In 2015, net capital outflow, according to Bloomberg, was $1.0 trillion. 2016, it was probably a little bit more, call it 1.1 trillion. 2017, that number went to zero, but not because the Chinese people were confident, but because China decided it was going to become a banana republic by increasing its draconian capital controls, many of which were not announced. So yes, China's moving away from reform and opening up. Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, believes in more state domination, not only of the underlying economy, but of the markets themselves. The path that he's taken before has, that has, the path that he's taken has led to tragedy in China, as we saw in the 1950s and the 1960s. So this is not a good story. And then fifth, 
The United States can impose costs on Chinese companies, as we saw with the seven-year ban on ZTE, the embattled Chinese telecom equipment manufacturer. That ban, before it was modified, shook not only the Chinese tech sector, but also the Chinese political system. We know that Huawei Technologies, the pride of China's tech sector, is also subject to um, Justice Department investigation for breaking Iran and North Korea sanctions. Chinese banks have been laundering money for North Korea. That makes them subject to uh, penalties in the United States, not only huge fines, but also being unplugged from the global financial system. So there's a lot that we can do. And one final point. People say, look, oh, China can retaliate against U.S. companies in China. Yeah, China can, and it does. But as Chinese officials know that this is the worst thing for China to do, because China took decades in creating this good reputation for being a reliable member of global supply chains. But Xi Jinping, with his retaliation against U.S. and other companies, is ruining that. So this is a punishment more on China than it is on ourselves. And when you put this all together, it does appear that we can prevail in the trade war or whatever else you want to call it. But whatever it is, we do need to protect our intellectual property. Thank you. So thanks for those opening statements. I'd like to give each of you a, a chance to respond and to really to start to start a conversation. Um, and so since, uh, since Gordon, you just talked, maybe uh, Stephen, if you'd be willing to start us off with the, the responses. And then if you have, each of you, if you have a question for the other, please feel free to, to ask it. Well, you know, I will, number one, um, commend Gordon for, for making a case that, that Certainly, it's so obviously wrong. <laughs> it certainly resonates with um, the the criticism of China that's been uh, widely talked about for a number of years, and uh, I think I would like to just focus on one aspect of that criticism, the one that you and I both agree on, which is that this is a conflict over. Uh, intellectual property uh, and the role that that plays in really defining uh, our future and in the future that China aspires to. And I agree with you that that was the focus of the report released by uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer in March, which then has become the, quote, intellectual justification for the, uh, the tariffs uh, that have been launched. You also mentioned this um, estimate that has become part of the narrative that came out of a um, report um, that has now been updated, this um, IP Commission report by John Huntsman and uh, who, who was the other co -op? Dennis Blair. Yeah, Dennis Blair. Two distinguished um, uh, experts who have um, uh, examine this and you know I, I have I have to say I've, I've looked at this report too and, and like Lighthizer's report I mean it, it looks really good I mean they're you know the fonts are good the margins are good it's got a you know nice slick cover to it um, and you, you just sort of want to believe that as you know the conclusion that report says is that the US is losing um, and their estimate is pretty broad between 225 and 600 billion dollars a year in the way of overall intellectual property theft to the world as a whole. And then they have a special section on China and they don't really apportion uh, uh, an exact uh, amount of that to China, but they do have a number buried you know, in, in one of these you know, beautifully designed pages with all of its font that um, in, ter in terms of pirated uh, 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 goods that are seized at the border by the U.S. Customs Patrol, 87% of all pirated goods uh, can be accounted for by Greater China. 52% uh, from um, the PRC and 35% from Hong Kong, one of my favorite cities in the world where I used to live. But that, that number, the 87 percent, a lot of people then multiply the estimate from two, 225 to 600, total IP theft, 
by 87% and then they get a China number. That's an indication of just the flawed math that underpins uh, all of this. Because there are three um, components of, um, of, of, of alleged uh, IP theft that the U.S. faces that the Huntsman uh, Blair report points out. One, counterfeit and pirated goods. Two, pirated software. And three, trade secrets. And you have to look carefully, and I've done this, at the methodology they use to come up with each of those numbers. And it is not worth the paper it's printed on. It's terrible. Um, especially the, um, the trade secret, which is by far the biggest portion of this um, high-profile estimate uh, that uh, Huntsman and Blair put out. Um, there is absolutely no uh, concrete data on the theft of intellectual property associated with uh, trade secrets. They, they, they actually, in that report, they footnote another report that was done by an, an equally shady group um, <laughs> that, that estimates that they have no data whatsoever on the amount of IP that we lose through uh, the theft of trade secrets uh, through surreptitious uh, means. They use what they call indirect proxies to build a model to suggest what that number would be. And they use things like um, narcotics trafficking data, um, illicit financial flows, uh, measures of corruption, uh, occupational fraud, tax evasion. And then from that, they blow this up to some massive estimate of uh, IP theft uh, that has absolutely no validity in the hard data that one can collect in this. So it's a long way of saying that, that the narrative on how much China steals from us every year because of what they do through hacking or uh, espionage is based on anecdote and innuendo. There are no hard data to substantiate um, those claims. And I could go take you through the pirated software, uh, the counterfeit and pirated goods. The only hard data in, in any of these reports that I've been able to uncover is that in 2015, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol group um, seized um, uh, $1.35 billion of goods uh, that were uh, pirated goods coming from um, either the PRC uh, or Hong Kong. $1.35 billion. And then it gets blown up to 200 to 300 to 400 billion. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, I, I worked for a long time on Wall Street where we're sometimes accused of being slippery with numbers, but we've never, ever <laughs> taken a 1.35 and blown it up to 200, 300, 400 billion. Right, Gordon? Well, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. That's fair. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree with you. There is no hard data because what we're talking about is something which is just by its nature uh, incredibly difficult to define. Um, and it's because you'd have to be at every business transaction. You'd have to be at every stall in Shanghai to figure all this out. But I know, for instance, that when my wife and I lived there, you know, we were just looking at all of the pirated material that you could find. And I have to say that, not to my credit, I did buy one Elton John CD, which I'm sure was pirated. But yeah, there's a lot there. But it also, I, you know, Stephen, I think it corresponds with a lot of what we know um, anecdotally um, from people who um, study China. Also from what we've seen recently in the last couple of days with these reports about increased Chinese cyber hacking um, of American corporates for the purpose of obtaining commercial information. That has increased substantially over the last several months, as everyone says. So there is something there. And, and whether it is, you know, three billion or 200 billion or 400 billion, that's going to be a subject for discussion. But you gotta remember though, that neither John Huntsman nor Denny Blair were of the type of, you know, folks who were going to give China a hard time because they very much came from the same camp you do. But there is a feeling, I think, in the United States and elsewhere that Chinese pirating has gone much too far. Um, so it's there. 
And so the issue is, what are we going to do about it? Because, as I mentioned, we've got an innovation-based economy right now. If you look at the S&P 500, today, 35% of the companies of the value of the S&P 500 is related to tech companies. That number is supposed to go up to about 40% in five years. So this is really important for us to be able to capture and to be to, to capture innovation, to commercialize it, and to produce the economies and the technologies of the future. Um, a lot of the other things that, that you mentioned, Stephen, I absolutely agree with you. Um, we do have a, a multilateral problem, um, and going after China, even if we were able to solve it, is not going to get us where we need to be, because we do need multilateral fixes. Um, our problems are structural. Um, in some ways, they're getting worse, um, and those ways they're getting worse have nothing to do with China. But nonetheless, China is an important component, um, part of this. The, the one thing that I'm concerned about, though, is that we're seeing China, um, through predatory policies, um, capture uh, manufacturing that should be, that would otherwise be located in other countries, not only ours, but others as well. And, and many of those other countries are our friends. Um, and we're looking at a China right now that is challenging not just the United States, not just its neighbors, but the international community across the board. And um, I think what we should be doing with trade in general is supporting our friends and allies and other countries that believe in, for instance, comparative advantage, which is the fundamental assumption of the global trading system. China obviously doesn't. We see G Xi Jinping closing up the Chinese economy. He's doing that by crippling foreign competitors. He's doing it by um, a massive bet on state industrial policy, state subsidies, um, all sorts of things that uh, violate their WTO, World Trade Organization obligations. So China's moving in the wrong direction. And this is an issue not just for the United States, but it's an issue for other countries that have benefited from the global trading system. And we're just going to have to get to a better status quo because the one that is we have right now is just not working. And it's not just populism in the United States as represented by the election of Trump. We're seeing um, perhaps the breakup of the EU and all sorts of things that aren't good, largely because the consensus that we have, uh, that's reigned for decades is just not working for most people. So, Stephen, can I ask you to go beyond talking about uh, talking about IP? And you know, so the the conventional wisdom among some is that China, beyond IP, has also limited market entry for other companies, uh, for companies, uh, and uh, in doing so, has you know, sort of carved out an unfair advantage for itself. So, if we move beyond just this issue of IP, I mean, is there wasn't there a need uh, before in uh, the last couple of years to sort of redirect? American trade policy, and sort of along similar lines, my question for uh, for Gordon is: is uh, do these tariffs? These tariffs don't get to IP, really. They don't get to uh, industrial policy. Uh, so, is this an effective policy for getting at some of these issues that you were that you highlighted as potential real problems for American competitiveness? All right, um, you know, market access <coughs> is a big deal. Uh, and um, in the case of China, as has been the case in many other developing economies over uh, decades, <coughs> uh, there has been, uh, it's starting to get relaxed a little bit, a requirement for foreign multinationals to enter into joint ventures uh, to, um, uh, if they want to do business in China. So you've got to pick a domestic partner. And this is, a, again, a centerpiece of uh, the charges raised by <coughs> the Honorable Robert Lighthizer, our uh, trade representative, um, alleging that the joint venture is a structure that forces companies to turn over their proprietary technology to their Chinese partners. So I don't get that. You know, I, I really don't. Um, first of all, you know, a joint venture is... Uh, a commercially signed, legally binding agreement. You're a lawyer, right, Gordon? So Was. You, you were, okay. I escaped. Okay, you escaped, <laughs> okay. So, you enter into these agreements um, willingly because you want to operate in, uh, in, in China. 
Uh, and let's just put aside for a second the fact that you know, maybe the agreement shouldn't exist uh, because that's a, that's a key issue, and you were alluding to that. But nevertheless, if you want to um, run your business in China, you're given the choice uh, to uh, whether or not you willingly uh, want to agree to this type of structure to, to do business. And when you're coming together with your partner uh, to build a joint business, um, you share people, you share strategies, you share um, uh, the way in which you design systems and, and, um, uh, and, and products. And I'll tell you this, um, in the interest of full disclosure, in my former life, <coughs> uh, I was a senior executive in a joint venture that my company had with the China Construction Bank. And we joined, signed a contract like 20 years ago. We invested a little bit of money to build China's first investment bank. I worked on that JV. At the end, I was a member of the board of directors of uh, the company called CICC. Some of you may have heard of it. It is the leading investment bank in China today. And we built it. We built it together with our partners. Uh, and we shared people and strategies. And we taught them how to do investment banking. Um, and we ultimately sold the stake out at a, you know, an incredible um, return uh, for our shareholders. But I can tell you on the basis of my first-hand experience, at no point in my 15 years of involvement in this deal was I ever forced to turn over anything. So we did this out of our own vo free volition uh, with commercial motives, uh, legally protected. And you might say, well, you know, in finance there's no technology. Um, and you can say all sorts of other bad things about uh, finance. But I would dare say there's a fair amount of technology in a knowledge-based business um, like um, investment banking, an awful lot of uh, intellectual property. Uh, and the idea that it was forced uh, in terms of us <coughs> turning it over to our partners is ludicrous. And I know also from my involvement with other businesses and clients that uh, I had while I was uh, living and working in uh, China and Hong Kong in the hard, very sophisticated technology area that most, admittedly not all, but most of their experiences were very similar to mine. So I just think, you know, with all due respect, Gordon, um, you know, it's important to, to, to be factually accurate in um, making these accusations uh, against China. If we, I mean, I, I realize we live, you know, in a political environment where we have things called alternative facts. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But I think we have to be very careful in using rumor and innuendo to um, uh, really form the foundation for these uh, deep and dark charges uh, against you know, another nation. Stephen, you know, in your area, you know, I agree. There was no, you know, there was no requirement of forced joint venture. You, you know, Morgan Stanley did this on its own volition, and and it's great that you guys made a lot of money. But there are certain areas where there are no JV requirements um, in um, China's accession agreement that China is enforcing a JV requirement. And this is the subject of a WTO case that the United States brought a couple months ago. Just to give you an example, um, in its accession agreement. China acceded to the WTO December 2001. Um, China agreed that within five years, it would allow American companies to issue credit cards, 2006. Well, China didn't do that. So we brought them to the WTO. We won a case in 2012. And today, you know, no American company is issuing credit cards in China, even though this was part of an agreement uh, last year, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Loss's 100-day plan that the Chinese said, yeah, we'll issue the rules. Well, just a couple days ago, China issued rules, and they gave a license to Amex. But the license, Stephen, is that Amex has to joint venture with a Chinese company. And that was not in China's accession agreement. And this is what we're talking about in terms of forced JV requirements. Certain areas, like Stevens, there are no, no uh, requirements. So. Um, what, what Morgan Stanley does, that's great, and, and I'm really happy they made a lot of cash. But the point is, in certain areas, um, China is obligated to allow foreign competitors in, and they don't have to join venture, but they are being forced to do so as a matter of Chinese law, 
This is probably a violation of China's WTO obligations. And this is what Lighthizer is complaining about. But as I said, it's all going to be sorted out because we did bring a World Trade Organization case. And this is going to be a subject of, of great contention over the next couple of years. Um, Dan, as to your question about whether the tariffs actually fix um, the question of IP, um, if you noticed in, I think it was the second slug of tariffs, um, the administration did impose them on products that benefited from China's Made in China 2025 initiative, which, by the way, is probably a WTO violation because of fixed requirements um, of percentage of domestic market. But put that aside, Stephen. Um, so the Trump administration did try to target the tariffs on goods that were being benefited by this state subsidy program, which doesn't look like it's um, uh, fair by any means, and which really has been become um, the target of a lot of foreign ire, in, not, including, uh, not just ours. Um, I, I think that if we go back and look at this, people are going to argue, and I think it's a really good argument, that the tariffs, no matter how high they are or how many goods they cover, are probably not going to get China to change its intellectual property theft. And I'm fully prepared to accept that argument, and I'm fully prepared to argue, look, the United States may have to go beyond tariffs. We may have to go on to import bans and stuff like that, things that are even more coercive um, than tariffs. Um, I hope we don't get there. I don't like tariffs. I'm sure Stephen doesn't like tariffs. Um, but the point is, we're going to have to try to ratchet up the pressure to see what works. Um, and hopefully, we can get the Chinese to see what is uh, evident to the rest of the world. And that is, it's not in their interest long term, and it's not in our interest for this intellectual property theft, whatever the amount, to occur. So I, I think we're, we're going on a direction where um, this is really just politically sustainable. It's the only one um, because we are not going to allow the Chinese to wa wantonly violate their WTO obligations. And as I said, it's not just us. It's the Europeans and everybody else are going to do the same thing. So this is not just um, Donald Trump. This is a lot of people in a lot of capitals around the world. Stephen, did you want a chance to respond? Well, I would just like to... Um, get back to a point that, uh, that Gordon made earlier, and that is that um, uh, America has, in terms of um, what's driving the stock market, what's driving uh, our economy right now and prospectively in the future, is this uh, remarkable success we've had in the areas of uh, innovation over a long period of time. And, and I certainly uh, echo that. And what that sort of begs to, to get into is the belief that, for some reason or another, China is truly uh, an existential threat to our capacity to stay the course. Whether it's, you know, in um, uh, you know, biotech or, um, you know, improvements in... Uh, a whole broad array of medical discoveries, to say nothing of uh, artificial intelligence and other forms of um, uh, internet-based um, uh, technology. Uh, is China really the threat to our prowess uh, in those areas? I think that's a, a really important question. And are these allegations of unfair practices, do they uh, represent uh, a dire as dire a threat uh, as uh, Lighthizer and then this uh, trade advisor whose name I promised not to bring up in this group. He's a former professor from the University of California in Irvine. Peter Navarro. Thank you. Um, I don't like mentioning his name in public. Um, really, they, they, they claim that China's policies uh, are aimed at, and this is Navarro's direct words, since you mentioned his name, I can, I can, you can do it now. Yeah. He claims that China's going after the crown jewels of America's uh, innovation prowess. And without those jewels, we have no future. Is that really true? And, number, and, and, and just the corollary to that, before you jump in and answer, is that makes it sound like China has no ability to do innovation on its own. And yet that is totally at odds with you know, China's uh, 
history, which goes back thousands of years, is the world's greatest innovator, giving us some of the most extraordinary innovations uh, in ancient times, from you know paper to um, you know, uh, uh, magnetic um, compasses to, of course, gunpowder, uh, missiles, and a whole host of other things. I would put to you that that DNA is still very much alive today. And what China's doing um, with um, its combination of educational reform uh, and admittedly copying some of the Silicon Valley type structures of our technology hubs is their innovation is alive and well. Uh, and um, uh, to claim that all of that is being accomplished uh, by unfair practices I think misses uh, the extraordinary developments that are going on in the way of Chinese science uh, with uh, brilliant young uh, researchers and some not so young uh, in pushing ahead on their own terms. We frame this as a zero-sum conflict. China does it, we can't. I say we can both do it. Uh, and we need to set up rules of engagement so we stay out of each other's stuff, as, as you, you seem to be alluding to, Gordon. But the idea that uh, uh, we alone uh, have the right to the crown jewels of the future, and no other country does, uh, I think speaks a lot to our own uh, paranoia uh, as the world's greatest um, economy. This may floor you, but I'm going to agree with most of what you said. All right. Oh, how do you like that? How do you like that? I think that certainly, um, you know, you look at Chinese innovation, um, and it is, um, it is impressive, especially in AI, especially in quantum computing and quantum communications and a whole host of other areas. And a lot of that stuff isn't stolen. So there's no question about it. A lot of it's state-directed. Um, I do think the state does tend to... Um, um, inhibit um, innovation in uh, certain areas, but nonetheless, th it is impressive. And, and I agree with you um, on the other point that uh, the most important thing for us is not to worry about China in a sense, but the most important thing is to make sure that we're strong. Um, I, and I know you've said this, and, and you're absolutely 100% right about it. Um, we don't do a lot of things in science and technology that we should be doing as a nation, and has nothing to do with China. Um, that's not to say, though, that we shouldn't be concerned about the theft by China and others. Um, but I agree with you. You know, whoever says that this is just China or this is, um, you know, that type of threat, you're absolutely right about that. Um, so it, it's a multifaceted solution for the United States. And, um, you know, we're going to have to mend our own knitting, um, as um, is evident not only in the innovation area, but in other areas as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm humbled to come to Yale, um, but I can tell you, uh, speaking in other places, um, the U.S. educational system is deficient, um, and that's what we've got to do. So it's time now to move on to, to closing statements so we have time to get questions from, from the audience. So before we do that, I just wanted to encourage you in your, your, your three or four minutes of your closing statement to think beyond the trade war. So there's a growing consensus in China, if the reporting's to be believed, I don't have a direct line into Zhongnan High, but that uh, the, there's, the Chinese leadership has decided that the trade war is sort of one part of a larger plan to, to keep China down and to prevent, China's, to prevent China's rise. So if we think in the big picture about uh, relations between China and the U.S. and the sort of U.S. grand strategy with China, uh, how should we think? How should we think about the trade war? So I wanted to put that out as as a kind of challenge, but you're free to do to sort of close however you'd like, and to give we'll give as our guest Gordon the last word. So Stephen, we'll we'll start with you, please. Okay, that's a <clears throat> a really you know great way to try to bring this into a as you said a you know a somewhat a different level, uh, and I I just say two things about this, uh, David. One, um, I, I do believe that we have, as a nation, been uncomfortable with the rise of China for a long time. Uh, and it's an uncomfortable uh, response that did not, it started long before uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, became president. It has, 
fairly broad bipartisan support uh, in our Congress uh, and has so uh, for some time. And whether or not it is the sort of implicit idea that America as the world's leading power is chafing at the fact that there's somebody else uh, that is rising as rapidly uh, as China is and that you know history doesn't treat that, that uh, type of uh, convergence uh, all, all too kindly, it's hard to say. Uh, but I, I do think if you look at some of the, um, there was a, uh, you would know this better than I, it was it published like last December, sort of the strategic. Uh, national security strategy. National security strategy uh, where um, the White House uh, and its staff, you know, put China literally on the same page uh, as a strategic threat as uh, Russia. Whether or not, or it was then, you know, most recently, uh, two weeks ago, this uh, major speech <coughs> by uh, Vice President Pence uh, that conjured up in many minds the idea that uh, this is far bigger than a trade conflict that could well be uh, a Cold War uh, reminiscent of that which we engaged in with the uh, former Soviet Union uh, for uh, you know, the first um, uh, I guess four, th three and a half to four decades of the post-World War II period. That remains to be seen. But I think uh, the grand strategy view is one that we are definitely uncomfortable uh, with the rise and the containment is very much uh, on our mind. And I, I guess the final thing I would say by way of um, you know, closing it, um, my comments at this point is just to go back to the point I started out with and that is we just we're failing in terms of informing the national debate if we fixate uh, through the blame game on others for um, the faults that we have no one to blame other than ourselves. And I go back to my point and for those of you who have been in my classes here on saving. We don't save as a nation. I can give you the numbers, but it's too late in the day to give you numbers. I can assure you that our savings rate, no matter how you look at it, for individuals, for businesses, for the government sector, add them up, take out depreciation, whatever, it's the lowest it's ever been for any leading nation in history. And that's the source of our problem because we want to grow without saving. And when we decide to do that, then we trick everybody because we need to borrow savings from others to get that growth going and that gives rise to these balance of payments and uh, trade deficits with so many countries and trade frictions first with Japan and Germany and now China and a lot of this is is of our own making and this debate um, really deflects um, uh, the hard work that needs to be done in getting our own ship uh, right. Okay, thank you. Gordon, last word. Yeah, there's no question we need as a nation to save more. Um, and Stephen's comments on this should be, um, you know, on the front page of the New York Times um, and the Wall Street Journal just every single day. Um, I don't think, though, that this is, um, if we look back at American history, that we have this, this sort of anti-China bias. You go back to the Nixon administration, you have four decades of American presidents who identified the success of China's Communist Party as a goal of American foreign policy. And that was even true up through the first year of the Trump administration. This year, not so much. Um, there is a change. Um, but I think the change really is not because of Trump or whatever or because of this innate feeling in the United States. It's because of feeling that China has really gone too far. Um, it is threatening its neighbors in an arc from India in the south to South Korea in the north. We see a much more coercive Xi Jinping who is um, extolling the, um, the virtues of Maoism. Um, we see um, the detainment of a million or more Uyghurs um, in what are concentration camps, which is a crime against humanity. Um, this is a country that is going in all the wrong directions, and the United States 
is justifiably concerned about this, especially because the Chinese military openly talks about um, killing Americans. The, the thing that, when you think about this, though, um, we've had a number of American presidents going back to Clinton who have been trying to manage American decline and trying to integrate China into the international system. And this is generous and benevolent, and this is something which um, I think the Chinese just didn't take the invitation. What they decided to do was to press the advantage. And that has caused uh, a change in the American political spectrum. And it's across the board. Um, it's not just Trump. It's not just Republicans. It's Democrats, even more so than the president. So. Um, this is not something which I think is China-specific in the sense that we were biased against the Chinese. This is something that the Chinese have sort of forced um, us to do. And it's not just in the United States. You see this across the world. So um, this is a China issue. Um, we're going to have to deal with it. Um, I think the important message that Stephen makes um, and one which we should all listen to is that we should um, concentrate on our own house, strengthen our own house, savings, education, all the rest of it. But nonetheless, we can't be oblivious to what's occurring in Asia right now. Great. Well, I just wanted to, before we move to audience questions, thank our <laughs> panelists. So questions from the audience. And I think Cameron will have a, a microphone so that your questions can be recorded for Posterity. It looks like there's a question in back. Oh, from uh, from Rob. Got it. Thanks. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I'm curious about your views on the blurring that we're seeing between the economic and the strategic and security concerns, uh, particularly as we move into the world of AI, uh, quantum computing, as you both mentioned, next generation technologies, the line between uh, purely civilian use and dual use seems to be blurring. And at the same time, uh, the US and Chinese economies more broadly uh, arguably have gone from being complementary, China being labor rich, the US being capital rich, uh, to now being competitive, where both c countries are trying to capture those next generation technologies and need to go to the same place to fulfill their aspirations. So I just would ask you both to speak to that sort of blending or blurring that we're seeing between security and economic concerns. How do you see that playing out in the context of the trade war? Um, and is there a risk on both sides, perhaps, of undermining uh, the prospects for uh, succeeding in those efforts to, to develop the innovation economy by closing off the market in the name of national security. Oh, you're doing me a big favor by asking me to go first. Um, I mean, those are great questions, and they're really difficult to answer. Um, but, you know, look at space, which I think is really um, emblematic of a number of things. The U.S. space program um, started out in, with many uh, military overtones. You know, the, the Mercury 7 astronauts were all former military officers. Um, but what's happened in the U.S. with the maturation of the program, there's been a real civilian um, space effort, which is separate and apart from military. In China, I don't think you can say that's the case. They're in an earlier stage of development. Not too much earlier, because they are, are really good at this stuff. Um, but nonetheless, you see much more emphasis on the military. Um, in China than you do here. And that, of course, leads us to a, a question for NASA. You know, cooperation with the Chinese space efforts are by law constricted because of, of this perception, which I think is correct, that uh, the Chinese space effort is inextricably uh, linked between civilian and military, and so therefore we should not be cooperating with it. Um, you know, in general, I think that the People's Liberation Army has extraordinary political power in the Chinese political system right now. Um, so they are driving um, this merger that you talk about. And it's not just space, it's across the board. Um, so this is, this is a challenge for us. You know, I, to talk about, um, you know, technological innovation, which we focused on today, you know, China had, uh, we went to the moon. And that's only because a guy named John Kennedy decided we were going to make this a national priority. Um, you know, it started, of course, with Sputnik and the Eisenhower era, but you have um, a nationally directed program. 
Well, most of China's programs in science, whether it's um, AI or quantum, or even in communications, is largely driven by the state. And under Xi Jinping, the state has been advancing and the private sector has been shrinking. Um, and some people will say shrinking rapidly. So if you look across the board of Chinese society, there is this um, blending that you talk about, which really is quite difficult for us to wrap our minds around because, um, and I'll just end up with Google. Um, you know, Google is, is going to cooperate with China in a joint venture in Chengdu, I think it is. But the joint venture partner is a company which is a front for the PLA. And so there's going to be in this country a lot of concern expressed about Google participating in this particular joint venture. And that, I think, is symptomatic of a number of issues that we're going to face as a society. Yeah, I, I don't <clears throat> think I have a whole lot to add on that. It, it is a great question, though. Um, this um, convergence between um, some of the economic issues, the trade issues, <clears throat> Um, the security issues uh, and uh, the role of the state in uh, overseeing uh, this convergence. <clears throat> we have one approach. China has another approach. Who's to say in, a, in the broad scheme of things uh, who is got the right view? And the, the Chinese system, and this has been, and I agree with Gordon's point, a hallmark of Xi Jinping, uh, there was this big set of reforms that was um, enacted about a year after he took office. <laughs> and uh, there was a real paradox in the thrust of those reforms. They said that on the one hand, the markets would play a decisive role in the allocation of scarce resources. And on the other hand, they said that he, um, to use the Chinese phrase, unswervingly supports the role of the state in its ownership of assets. Can you have both? We all said, pick one. And he said, no. We believe in the mixed ownership paradigm. Now, from our point of view, you know, is you know, Adam Smith driven invisible hand uh, market um, students of, of, of market-based resource allocation, we say, no, you, got, you, you can't do it that way. And yet, you know, the Chinese model of trying to blend um, both um, aspects of state control and market-driven allocation remains very, very important uh, to this day. And maybe it won't work. Maybe over time uh, they'll see that, you know, the inefficiencies of the system and the discontinuities in the way um, our resources are allocated uh, is, is, is too much for them to, to bear. And, and Gordon's uh, title um, that was cleverly chosen now 17 years ago uh, will, will be true. Um, in my defense, I will say that I said it would take 10 years, and I didn't anticipate the 2008 downturn. But we'll leave it at that. OK. Well, anyway, <laughs> look, it's a good title. Um, it's a good title. And um, but you know, I mean, you ask a very deep question about, about the convergence of grand strategy and uh, economics. And I think I would be the first to admit, as an economist, I tend to focus largely on my silo. The security guys focus on their silo. <clears throat> we have these dialogues sometimes where the security guys and the, the, econ the economics teams um, get together in the same room and they try to exchange views. And it's like, you know, I, I'm from Mars and you're from Venus. We don't even speak the same language. Uh, we need to do a better job in breaking down those barriers because no leadership from any country no political system is going to look purely from one perspective and think that's the way we have to make this decision. And I think we need to do a better job in trying to understand from the standpoint of China what this blended system means rather than just dismiss it as being inconsistent with our ideological framework and therefore just plow ahead and insist that 
the conversations need to take place on our terms or no terms at all. That's what worries me. So let's make one, one quick point on, on this question, which is if you take the long view and you think about Chinese history, Stephen alluded earlier to the, the great inventions of the past, the, uh, the compass, gunpowder, uh, a lot of the mechanical inventions that were invented in China were invented in times of external threat by governments, by government bureaucrats. Uh, and so I think there's a case to be made if you look at Chinese history in the long view, if you go back a thousand years to the Song Dynasty, which was an era in which China was threatened from without, uh, it gave officials and uh, incentives to be, to be inventive. So of course, the world now is a lot different than it was a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty. A lot, a lot has changed. Uh, but there is a kind of historical consistency to this idea that you can have state-driven innovation, and it's partly driven by, uh, by military competition, by uh, competition from without. Good point. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple. We'll start with maybe over here with uh, James. Hi there. So, um, okay. For uh, most of the talk, we were talking about the trade war from the pr pr perspective of firms um, and intellectual property theft. Uh, in your closing statements, we talked about it from the perspective of grand strategy. But we haven't talked about it from the perspective of individuals. Um, I'm sure you're both familiar with David Otter and David Dorn's work that attributes um, a large amount of lost jobs that were extremely geographically concentrated in a few US states. Do you think that was and should be a reason for trying to renegotiate our trading relationship with China? No, I don't. I think, <clears throat> I mean, David Autor from MIT is one of the great <laughs> labor economists um, uh, in the United States. But I, I think, you know, with all due respect to him, um, the idea that we have lost manufacturing jobs in the US because of China's WTO accession. I think that idea is, is again, ludicrous. Um, right after World War II, the manufacturing share of US employment uh, was in excess of 35%. Today, the number is eight and a half. Did China drive it from 35 to eight and a half? When China joined WTO, the ratio had already gotten down to 12. So maybe you know, uh, China's accession to WTO uh, accelerated the drop from 12 to 8.5. It's possible. Uh, and um, you know, there's a fair amount of work that's been um, uh, pu put into sort of pouring over the disruptions that occurred in the 2000s because of the surge of uh, Chinese imports. But let's not forget the fact that you know, um, from basically 1950 uh, to 2001, that share collapsed, not because of China. Trump would say it was NAFTA. Uh, but you know, I can give you the same numbers for NAFTA. That share collapsed because of the capital labor substitution that drives an advanced economy to boost productivity. That's the way it goes. And those jobs are gone. And so the idea that you know, the, the politicians, including the current president, can uh, say that, you know, by tariffs, I'm bringing back um, manufacturing. I'm going to make America great again. Um, I think, again, is, is just not a, uh, a careful assessment of the forces at work uh, and the correct policies we need to address that problem. The question does raise uh, an important issue for American society, and that is, when you look at not only China's WTO accession, but the other forces Stephen was talking about, um, we have seen a um, change in American society where the manufacturing sector has just been decimated. And we have seen the enrichment of certain communities, including the financial community. And in a democracy, that can work for a little while, but it can't work long term. And so I think that we are going to, you know, I agree with you, a lot of the stuff that comes out of the president's mouth on economics and trade in China doesn't make sense. But there is a fundamental political point here that the president does represent. Um, and I think that that's right. And that is, America has got to work for everybody. And I can remember driving, I spoke to the Air Force in the panhandle of Florida. And my wife and I flew into Atlanta and we drove down um, through Georgia, through Alabama, through Florida. 
And some of the communities, Stephen, were just completely boarded up, um, decimated. These are the communities that have been ravaged by fentanyl and the opioid crisis. And this is completely unacceptable for any country, um, especially the United States. So we're going to have to do something. And I don't know what the answer is. I wish I were smart enough. But we are going to have to rebalance our commercial and trading relationships with other nations um, because there is a very big segment of the American population that has been disadvantaged decade after decade. And we can't allow that to continue. Okay, so I think we have time for probably one more here. question. You have a question in the, in the back there. Yeah. Hi, thank you. So I want to revisit uh, the trade war topic, right? So it seems one important factor to consider is, as mentioned, the relative strength of the American and Chinese economies. And I would agree that China's figures are often non-transparent and possibly off. And so I want to inquire a little more about the proxy that Mr. Chang offered. Uh, was it um, primary energy consumption growth? Right, so two sub-questions, right? The first one is, isn't China undergoing a massive program to try and reduce its energy intensity, and wouldn't that cloud that growth figure? And second, would you happen to have the figure for the United States so we can do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison instead of GDP growth versus energy consumption growth? Thank you. Yeah. Clear, clearly, China um, is trying to change um, energy in intensity. And it's been, doing, it's, it's been making some progress, but clearly it's still a laggard when you compare it, especially to a country like Japan, where you should see sort of the same. Um, there have been um, during periods, and, and the reason why this was important to me was because my wife and I, we lived in China um, at the end of the 1990s, where there were these wonderful numbers coming out of the National Bureau of Statistics. But we were living there. And even though we were in Shanghai, which is a, a particularly prosperous part of China, always has been, always will be, um, nonetheless, it was clear that there was a recession in China. And that was clear, especially as you got out of the municipal limits and you started traveling around the country, which we did because we were working on deals. Um, and, and at that time, people were saying, oh, you know, you can't, you can't, um, you know, the energy numbers don't correlate with GDP growth. You can't say, oh, because energy intensity has decreased, um, therefore the economy must have decreased. But clearly there was um, a correlation. And when things snapped back, you know, you saw energy consumption increase dramatically as GDP increased. So I, it's not a perfect proxy, of course, um, but I think it's, it's like, as I said, the single best one. If you look at the Li Keqiang Index, which is an attempt to be a little bit more sophisticated at it because they add in bank lending, but nonetheless, you see that there is this emphasis uh, on energy. Um, so I think it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. As regard to the United States, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but it's a really good question, and I'm going to have to go back and do some homework tonight. I don't really have <clears throat> much to add. I, I would agree with Gordon that um, China remains still uh, far too reliant on uh, energy, especially coal, 60% of its <clears throat> fuel source uh, today. Uh, China's made significant um, reductions in lowering the, the, the primary energy intensity of its GDP, the units of primary energy required to produce GDP. And so that would tend to bias your correlation uh, to the downside, Gordon. But the progress that China's made is not as great as that which has been made, as you alluded to, by other more advanced economies. And that is, um, uh, I think, a disturbing result for China, not just with respect to its energy costs, but also with respect to its uh, horrific uh, environmental challenges that are an outgrowth of its um, uh, inefficient uh, technology of, of energy consumption. Uh, the final thing I would say is I, I've heard for years from you and others about how the Chinese numbers vastly overstate GDP and the number is, you know, so much lower than the published estimates. And um, I've looked at all the studies that have been done of the accuracy of the numbers. And um, 
the really careful scientific studies done by analysts um, in this country and internationally uh, find that the, the, the published numbers are surprisingly more accurate than the, the doomsday guys would lead you to believe. So I wanted to give each I wouldn't call you a doomsday guy. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. So I wanted to give each of you one, one minute, if, if you would, for any sort of take-home points as people go home tonight and think about, uh, think about this debate, which I think has been a fruitful and interesting debate. Is there sort of one big take-home point that you think people should go home with tonight? And uh, well, Stephen, well, again, we'll start with you so that Gordon can have the last word. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, the big take home point is that China does pose a cross the board challenge. Um, but Stephen's absolutely right. Um, the main way as a society that we're going to meet that challenge is strengthening ourselves through savings, um, which, as I said, should be on the front page of every paper every day, plus also education, which is lagging in this country, plus other things. So, you know, our, what made this country great is what we should continue to do. And um, that's not to say that, but I, I do believe that we need to meet the China's challenge because it is an integral part of that. But, you know, it's primarily an issue at home for us to deal with, and that's where we're going to win or lose the battle for our society. Home. Okay, and my uh, even briefer uh, sort of a footnote to that point is that what is it about the character of our nation that has a history? Again, I go back and I'll give you um, the examples being uh, Japan, now China, uh, of... <coughs> turning to others and holding them responsible for what ails us. It's just a huge change from a nation who came out of World War II uh, at a time of um, great global trauma uh, and um, uh, devoted considerable resources to rebuilding nations that had been destroyed during the war. Uh, it was certainly um, uh, an opportunity to do something uh, more reminiscent of what we did after World War I, which backfired, uh, to uh, punish those who lost. But we didn't do that. We were a benevolent um, uh, very giving nation in terms of devoting our resources to rebuilding uh, the nations that we defeated. What transpired between the early 50s and the 1980s uh, to affect our national character as a, as a country that wants to hold others responsible for the problems that we are unwilling or unable to face at home? It's just a question. I don't have the answer. Great. Well, thanks to both of you. Thank you.